So I actually lived in Chicago from 2000 to 2003, so I'm really excited to be back. I was at the Hawks game last night, game six. Go Hawks, yes, very exciting, very exciting. Um, hopefully, if time allows, there'll be a Cubs game in my future. But I met Rob uh, uh, several years ago, and I've seen Ken grow quite a bit. And, Ken, and uh, Rob asked me, hey, Slava, will you uh, speak at Ken? You're going to give him one of the talks. Uh, OK. Uh, what would you like me to talk about, Rob? Just, you know, there's going to be some entrepreneurs. There'll be super senior folks from Fortune 500 companies. People will be flying in. Just make it interesting. <laughs> OK, so here we go. So we have uh, 14 minutes left, and I'm going to give you 150 years in 14 minutes, which we're going to go back to the 1880s up to 2030. We're going to make some predictions for the future. All of this will be related to finance. I'll talk pretty fast because I don't have that much time, but I'm going to try to give you a lot of content. So in short, here's our journey. This is what we think of when we think of finance. This is a metaphor. This is an image, a symbol for waiting in line to ask somebody for permission. Mr. Banker, Mrs. Banker, can I have money? No. VC, Kent, no. Uh, government person, no. Boss, no. So you always have to ask somebody for permission and they get to decide, right? Well, actually, it doesn't have to be that way. This is obviously from the days of the Depression, et cetera, but you can really think about this from any country. Think about it more like this, right? Which is, this is the Statue of Liberty. Why am I showing this in a funding presentation? Well, actually, the base of the Statue of Liberty was crowdfunded. The actual statue was free, but there was a guy named Joseph Pulitzer who was the leader of a paper called The New World, and we were not actually going to get the Statue of Liberty in America unless we got the money to be able to put it on the base. We had private investors for half of it. We had a gap of about $150,000. Joseph Pulitzer, using his technology at the time, watch this, newspaper, right? He sends it out frequency once every two weeks. His radius is about 100 miles. His distribution, about 10,000 people he's able to raise the $150,000 he needs. He gives nothing in return. No profit, no perks, no name on a stone, nothing. Just liberty. Will you be part of this? I'll give you money. Otherwise, we're not going to get the Statue of Liberty. People actually gave the money on average 88 cents. What's cool is not that he got 150 grand, right? What's cool on average 88 cents. So just think about that. That was 150, 130 years ago. Fast forward, and then you get this. What is this? Well, the, the uh, hives that you think about when you get honey, they come out of usually white boxes. That is technology that was patented in 1850. And you know, you have to open it up, you get stung by the bees, you put on the white suit, you get the smoking machine, all that stuff. I know half of you probably do this, right? <laughs> right. But actually, wouldn't it be better if you didn't have to sting, get stung by the bees? You didn't have to do it once a year. You didn't actually have to disturb the bees. Crazy. Well, actually, a couple folks in Australia have created that. They created technology, which is a cell structure, where the bees will go into the cell, fill it up with honey. You turn the crank, it opens the cell structure, the honey goes down through gravity, pulls up at the bottom. You just open the tap, guys, a tap, right, like beer, and it goes down like honey right into your uh, anything, cup. And then all of a sudden, you close the cell, the bee comes back and said, huh, I thought I already filled this up, but... <laughs> I'm going to fill it up again. You turn the crank, it opens the thing, honey goes down, you close it, you see how this goes, right? Now you can have fresh honey anytime. It's a good idea, right? Well, actually, they put it up on Indiegogo because nobody else actually believes in it. And what happens? Actually, they raised $12.5 million in six weeks. And how many countries do they fund it? This is the most from any platform anywhere in the world. 152 countries fund, fund, not look, every single country in the world looked at this project, every single one. 152 countries took money through their currency or whatever and funded it on Indiegogo. I mean, that's amazing. Distribution, the world. Frequency, anytime. Reach, the world, right? So it's just like fascinating. You could do it as much as you want. I mean, that's the speed, which is Joseph Pulitzer really figured it out. He just kind of sent me a message saying, hey, make it better. Okay, cool. So here's like the really fast version of history, and I'm not going to do this well, uh, but I'm just going to give you really fast, which is before 1933, anybody could ask money for absolutely anything, and then a lot of grandmas got uh, taken advantage of. Grandma says, hey, governor, I'm upset. Governor says, well, grandma's going to vote me out, so no more anybody asking anybody for money unless it's the SEC. They created the Securities Act of 1933, which means you can only get money uh, if it's an IPO from the SEC. Otherwise, you have to be a rich person, an accredited investor, which means you have over a million dollars in net worth or over $250,000 of salary. This is plus minus the same all around the world. So we'll fast forward, and then you get the 60s. You get big banks, 
right? And then all of a sudden, you start getting credit cards. Well, that's pretty cool. And then you started getting the first kind of solicitation, which is NPR, a radio business, which is really nonprofit. They're like, well, you give me some money so I can keep doing this. Pretty cool. Radio, we're not quite at the internet, right? We did newspaper back in the 1800s, and now we're starting to get into radio. So that's pretty cool. PayPal adds digital currency, so you can do it online. Friendster shows social networking, which obviously becomes MySpace, then Facebook, and these things all evolve. And then you get Indiegogo as an idea in 2007. Then you start getting President Obama's campaign. This is very local, obviously, with Chicago. But actually, President Obama was the first person to raise over a million dollars online with sub $100 contributions. And this really starts to become main, more mainstream for people to say, hey, we can actually get lots of individuals to pool money together to make one big chunk of money. And then you get uh, Square and other devices, a lot more um, advancements in 2012. You then get President Obama coming back, and he signs the Jobs Act, which is to try to allow for equity crowdfunding and lots of other interesting things to be able to happen in the funding space. As a matter of fact, one of our campaigners was on stage with President Obama. She's the one wearing a blue dress. We can't exactly see her. And he says, the bank said no, but Indiegogo said yes, and we need more of that. Right? And now, Reggae Plus, which is something that's going to come out in June, Anybody who knows about equity crowdfunding, again, I'm not really giving the attention it deserves, but you could ask about it later. This is going to revolutionize all of how funding gets done. It's not quite Title III, and I know I'm jumping past what some people understand, but when Title III happens, hopefully in the next couple of years, it'll be really cool. Point is, this is only in 80 years, right? Imagine how this is all going to keep advancing. So then you have lots of Indiegogo projects, great. So in case you're wondering, we send money to 70 to 100 countries a week. Millions of dollars are the largest platform in the world every week. The world wants democratization of capital. So this is just how the industry has evolved. This is the entire finance industry that we see in terms of innovative, uh, where it's heading. I'll stop there. Usually people take pictures. Yes. <laughs> You're probably like, oh, yes, I was worried about those guys. So this is just broken down of the entire finance industry um, into different areas. You can say, is that finance or not? We'll talk about that later in a second. So here's what I like to call the loop, which is it's not a one-way conversation. It's not, can I have the money banker? No, you cannot. See, that's a simple transaction. This becomes much more of a relationship, right? You're getting an entire feedback loop of Market validation. You know, that honey. No one wanted to say yes to them, but when they put it out on Indiegogo, the market is starting to say, we here in Spain love this. We here in Australia love this. We here in Israel love this. We here in America love this. We like the fact that the price point is $99 or $699. We start getting feedback right away, instantaneously. So that market validation is really powerful. Second, you get to test the marketing, right? I didn't play the video for you, but they changed the video a couple times. You know, do you want to show the product first? Do you want to show the founders first? How do you want to scale this out? You get more promotion than you ever could on your own. Because now you're starting to have everybody to come together that all want to share. It's almost like a financial minga. Everybody just coming together. <laughs> there you go. So, and what I think is the most powerful thing is you get to create relationship. Which is, see, most organizations you get disintermediated from the actual customer. See, if you're a filmmaker, AMC owns the customer. If you're a musician, Apple with iTunes owns the customer. If you're writing a book, Amazon owns the customer. See, transactions get commoditized, relationships become brands. So everybody wants to be in the D to C business, the direct to consumer business. No one wants to go through some other entity, but they have to because of the way it works. But you don't actually have to, the more things get democratized by these tools and the internet is the ultimate democratization platform. So anytime that somebody says you have to go through this whatever, you don't. There's this thing called the internet. <laughs> so what's next? Here's where we get into a little bit of the future. Again, we'll talk fast here, but um, I believe that small businesses are gonna continue to evolve and even bigger businesses are gonna start getting into this space. So for example, Stone Brewery here, they have 1,000 employees. They're not some mom and pop. 1,000 employees, and they were trying to decide if they're going to open a brewery in Germany. They went on to Indiegogo, and the crowd said, yes, we want the first independent brewer to ever have a European brewer, the uh, first American independent brewer to ever have a brewery in Europe. Boom, $2.5 million. And I think that's going to continue. You're going to have the best buys, 
you're going to have the storefronts. They're always getting paid for buyers to make decisions. Those decisions are their opinions, their experience. I feel it. I don't feel it. You're just going to track the data. And you're going to say, that flow hive, that honey thing, I want that in my store. Because the data will show market validation. So this is how big companies will be starting to make their decisions. They'll outsource the R&D to these platforms, which is a segue here. I mean, we've already had Google, Philips, Honda, Domino's, all these different companies work with Indiegogo, not because we're seeking them out. Because this is where the future is going. R&D budgets are always speculative. People want to figure out where can I find this information. You create some sort of customer research forum and you pay people $100 each to give you feedback. Don't pay anybody anything. Have it go up and everybody will give you feedback by themselves because they'll just show you they want this or they don't. Individuals are completely disrupting nonprofits. I think you already saw Craig speak about this in a different manner, but on Indiegogo, you have this kid who's 12 years old, I believe as well, and there's the blogger, Brandon, who represents Honey, Humans of New York, photographs him and said, who's your most inspiring person? He said, oh, my principal. And he was really shocked that it wasn't one of his parents and it wasn't his teacher. Your principal? She's like, yes, my principal, Ms. Lopez, always makes me feel good, even though we're in inner city Brooklyn, a really bad bar of Brooklyn. You know, I always feel like I could do anything. He goes to speak to the principal. The principal says, yeah, I try to inspire these kids to believe they can do anything. Most don't ever go to uh, high school. What can I do to help? Well, I'd like to all take them to Harvard, because I want them to know that this is possible. So in two weeks, he helps raise them $1.5 million. $30,000 takes a class to Harvard. They're going to Harvard for decades. <laughs> which is cool because all those kids get to be inspired to say, I can actually maybe go here, which they never really would have thought of. Venture capitalists are now deciding on their pipeline based on Indiegogo. There's already hundreds of millions of dollars of VC money that has followed an Indiegogo campaign. Some of these campaigns, some of these investments are happening three weeks after the launch of the Indiegogo. They're like, oh, I need to get this right away. And in my opinion, the future holds where every bank will offer this as a financial product. Small businesses get turned down all the time because if you don't have revenues over two years, you can't actually get a loan in America. And if you have revenues over two years, most likely you're going to get rejected. Small business today becomes big business tomorrow. You would have said yes to them for a college loan, a home loan, a car loan, but you said no to them for a small business loan. They hate you forever. It's like the Mazda Miata concept. The reason you get a Mazda Miata is because later they're going to buy lots bigger cars. You lose them once, you lose them forever. Everybody's going to want to offer this product just the way credit cards, no one makes credit cards. Every bank offers credit cards. You want to cross-sell, upsell, you want to capture the data. This will be the new financial product of the future. And to me, the ultimate industry, the slowest industry is the government. They're all going D to C. Everybody's going direct to consumer. The film industry is going around, you know, everybody's going around, Best Buy is going around, they're trying to find it, but they all mostly are through their hourglass shape of they make the decisions. So think about it, on the outside of that hourglass shape of decision makers, all this open space. But to me, the ultimate hourglass shape is the government, right? We choose people to represent us. They are our AMC theaters, they are our Best Buy. Why can't it just be direct to consumer? So to me, by 2030, we will have an escrow account from the government. So imagine you pay $100 in taxes. $25 of those taxes will be held in an escrow account. There will be people on the other side that will create city projects, state projects, country projects, world projects. And then you will use your escrowed account tax dollars and you will deploy them against any project you want. Which means direct to consumer. You will be in full control of where your taxes go based on the projects that were already set up. Now I know you think this is crazy, that's fine. But that's where it's going to head. It's the slowest industry, right? Film, music, newspaper goes first. Then you get energy, uh, um, medicine, and those types of things, fi finance. Government will be last, but that's where it will head. This is a perfect example. This is solar roadways. Solar roadways was turned down by all the institutions. It's exactly what it sounds like. Solar roadways, what does that mean? Well, we used to have analog phones, and now we have smartphones. Well, why is it every one of our roadways is an analog roadway? What a waste. 
Why can't they be smart roadways? Well, what does that mean? Imagine a digital layer on top which captures the sun, all the energy. Well, that's cool. And you put it all into the grid. Well, imagine that the cars on top of that can feel, it feels where the cars are, so if you're going to potentially crash, it can send a signal. So imagine there's potentially a deer in front of you. You're just getting a signal back that, oh, car, there's a thing on top. This is all just very Bluetoothy, very just RFID. This is not that hard. It just will take a lot of infrastructure in terms of actually be able to create it. Why is it that we have painted lines? Why can't the lines just adjust based on how much traffic or not there is so you can know where you go? Oh, yeah, this all makes sense. See, actually, we have some of the funding already happened on Indiegogo, two and a half million dollars, and now governments are coming into the back behind it. This is actually how this will all evolve. So here are just some local examples right here in Chicago. Um, you have Roger Ebert, the documentary about him that was actually on CNN. Uh, you have Lantern, which is super cool. It's a device that's about the size of a brick. It actually gets internet data straight from the satellites anywhere in the world, and they offer it completely for free. They raise like $650,000. Uh, you have Industrial Design School, and then you have the UMI, which is a super cool way of taking hardware and software to have a better connected home. They're the largest funded project in Chicago ever on any platform. They only have been open for a few weeks. They still have over, over three weeks left to go, and they're already at like a million and a half dollars. So I'm done, but I'll leave you with this. I'll leave you with this, final slide. Why am I showing you a slide about two women with ice, which is in the beginning of the 1900s was the beginning of ice creation as opposed to taking ice from somewhere and bringing it, right? So ice creation started as a centralized factory where there was ice. People would come to the centralized factory and they would take the ice. 20 years later, there was ice fleets, distribution. You had those boxes that got set up by stores in different places and they would take horse and buggy or one of the new Model Ts and they would take the ice from the centralized place and bring it to one of those new areas, right? So that way you didn't have to walk as far. And then 20 years later, there was a new concept called the refrigerator, okay? So what I'll tell you as fact is one of the companies that was in the top 20 in the first industry never made it into the top 20 of the second industry. One of the companies that was in the top 20 of the second industry never made it into the top 20 of the third industry. But we now have the luxury of the omniscient view 100 years later, and it's very obvious that getting ice from the centralized factory or getting a refrigerator all is the same purpose. So I ask you, what industry are you in? Thank you.